All right, so now let's talk about matrix multiplication coupled with our dot product interpretation. Let's remember what the dot product perspective on matrix multiplication is. So suppose we have to multiply two matrices. Let's say this one has four rows, probably four by three. This one would be three by five columns. And so the answer is of course four by five. And we can obtain the answer entry by entry where each of the entries is a dot product of some row from this matrix with some column from this matrix. For example, this entry right here will be the dot product of this column and this row. And now let's add a little bit of geometry to this just like we did before. Let's not think of these as just vectors in Rn. Let's think of them as the components of some geometric vector in our space broken up into components with respect to this basis. Well, then I would say the same thing, that this entry is the dot product of the vector represented by these numbers and the vector represented by these numbers. So it's the product of the length of those vectors times the cosine of the angle between them. Seems a little bit artificial that I brought geometry into this, but you'll see in a moment that it'll pay off. Okay, so what this matrix ends up being is all possible combinations of dot products between these rows and these columns, right? There are four vectors represented here. There are five vectors represented here. So there are 20 possible combinations for dot products, every row with every column. So this matrix is four by five. So it has those 20 entries. So each one of the entries uh, is interpreted is the dot product of one of these with one of these organized very neatly into a table. So we'll be interested in evaluating lots of dot products probably for the remainder of the course. So what this shows is that all of the dot products that could be relevant to a problem can all be uh, calculated in a single shot by a single matrix multiplication. Not to say that it's not a lot of work because a single matrix multiplication actually involves lots of work. And uh, there is a lot of work here, as there always is. But that doesn't change the fact that from the point of view of matrix multiplication, it looks simple. That's what we're after. Let's now talk, so that we're done here, let's now talk about this scenario. Suppose we have the same matrix A, and we're going to find the product a transpose A. So let the matrix A have four columns. Each one is three entries long. And then the product A transpose A is always compatible. And the result is a square matrix. And it's a symmetric matrix. All of these questions we've discussed before when we discuss the transpose. But now let's look at the result from the point of view of the dot product. What we have here, following this example, is all possible dot products with the columns of this matrix and the rows of A transpose. But the rows of A transpose are the columns of A. So that's very nice. What we have in this matrix is the dot product interplay between the columns of A and themselves. It's interplay. So it's the interplay among the columns of A. So that's what we have here. So this matrix would be four by four, right? So I have 16 numbers and this 16 numbers, you don't even have to pay attention to this half, are the all possible combinations of in dot products. Again, I may have been saying inner products. I mean nothing but dot products at this point. All possible combinations of dot products of the columns of A. So that's very interesting. If we're only interested not in two sets of vectors and how they interact with each other, but a single set of vectors and how these vectors interact within themselves, then we would multiply A transpose by A and boom, get the matrix of all the possible dot products among these vectors. Now, that's understood. From that, a few very nice things follow. For example, what would happen if all of these vectors were orthogonal to each other? 
what would characterize the result? A quick note, in the three-dimensional space, we cannot possibly have four orthogonal vectors. That's geometrically obvious. And then we'll algebraically generalize to arbitrary vector spaces. You cannot have more orthogonal vectors than the dimension of the space. So if you actually want this to be a valid question limited to three columns or fewer, but ignoring that point, we can just ask the question here. What would be the property of the matrix? How would you characterize the result if all of these were mutually orthogonal? It means any two are orthogonal, pairwise orthogonal, not mutually orthogonal, pairwise orthogonal. And the answer is the matrix will be diagonal. Why? Because all of the octagonal entries represent the dot product of one of the columns with another, not with itself, with another. The dot product with itself ends up on the diagonal. So off the diagonal entries, because they represent these, those dot products, would be zero. And we would have a diagonal matrix. Now what if in addition to being orthogonal, there were also all unit length, sort of like these bases are. They consist of orthogonal, base, orthogonal vectors, which are all unit length. Well, then it won't be just diagonal. It would be the identity matrix, right? Once again, not possible with four vectors, but if it was just two, then we would have a two by two identity matrix. It's also possible with three columns, and then we would have a three by three identity matrix. Not possible with four, because you cannot have four orthonormal or even orthogonal vectors in a three-dimensional space. So that's what we would have. And now you might uh, understand, uh, it might come to you, that what we're really talking about when we're talking about orthogonal columns that are also unit length, let me throw out a definition. Vectors like that would be called orthonormal meaning they're both orthogonal and unit length. They've been normalized to unit length. Orthonormal, right? That that's the sort of thing we're talking about with orthogonal matrices, and it will immediately make sense to you why those matrices are called ortho orthogonal, those square matrices Q. So let's talk about those matrices briefly, because there is something more or less magical waiting for us in that discussion. So I will once again erase the board and then we'll talk about a matrix Q such that Q transpose Q equals the identity matrix. So now we're looking at an orthogonal matrix Q characterized by the identity Q transpose Q equals the identity matrix. This was our original definition for what an orthogonal matrix is. And back then we didn't understand why this relationship would lead to the term orthogonal. Well, now we understand why it's called orthogonal, because this relationship implies that the columns of Q are all pairwise orthogonal. That is illustrated on this diagram. Here I have three distinct columns of Q, and when you take Q transpose, these columns become rows. And because the result is the identity matrix, as we just discussed, that means that the columns are mutually orthogonal somewhat justifying the name orthogonal. But of course it's a very bad name because these columns aren't just orthogonal, they're orthonormal. So of course the matrix should have been called orthonormal because its columns not orthogonal but in fact orthonormal. I actually consider it a big oops as far as naming rights go. So there was an opportunity to name it right and they missed it. So this matrix should have been called orth orthonormal but we're stuck with the name orthogonal, but at least now we understand the rationale behind that term. Now it's time for a bit of magic. And even though what's about to happen is very clear and won't be at all a surprise, it's still so, for lack of a better word, magical, that I'm still str struggling to wrap my mind around it a little bit. And here it comes. We know simply from matrix theory that if Q transpose Q equals the identity, of course, matrices don't commute in general, but when their product is the identity, then they do commute a matrix and its inverse commute. So we also know that Q, Q, Q transpose equals the identity matrix as well. 
All right, now let's talk through this. When we have this relationship, it immediately tells us that the columns of Q are orthogonal, in fact, orthonormal. Now, if we look here and give it the same interpretation, and just as a reminder, one more time, this doesn't come from talking about dot products or lengths or angles or anything like that. That's pure matrix algebra. Matrices that multiply to give the identity matrix commute. That just very, very fundamental comes long before any talk of dot products. But now, looking at this identity, which is implied by this identity, they're implied by each other, we know that the columns of Q transpose are orthonormal. And the columns of Q transpose are, of course, the rows of Q. So, in other words, the rows of Q are orthonormal. That's hard to believe. What we have just obtained from something we knew long ago is that if the columns of Q are orthonormal, then its rows are orthonormal as well. Here's why it's hard to believe. Here's one way to find an orthogonal matrix. Take any three orthonormal vectors, like this. There we go. And it doesn't matter how you orient them, orient them in a random way. And then decompose each one of them with respect to this basis. And put their decompositions as columns in a matrix. That will be an orthonormal matrix. Why? Because the columns that it came with, the actual vectors, are orthonormal. Their dot product is zero, and so these columns will be orthonormal in our new algebraic sense. And there you go. You have an orthonormal matrix. And if you look at that matrix, whose columns were made orthonormal on purpose, and look at its rows, they will be orthonormal in the exact same sense. Let me give you one example. I have one up on the computer, so I'll prepare, well, let me actually erase this and use this space. Here it is. I specifically came up with a matrix whose columns are orthonormal. Let's make sure of that. It's very easy to make sure that they're orthogonal. So let's take any two, and you can actually ignore the denominators because the denominators won't change the fact that something is zero. It'll just scale zero. And um, of course, denominators are consistent. That's why we can do that. So just paying attention to the numerators, let's dot the first two columns. And we'll have three times four plus zero times five minus four times three. That's zero. Now, first and third, negative three times four, zero, plus four times three. That's also zero. And finally, second and third, minus 16 plus 25 minus nine. Zero once again. So the columns are orthogonal. And just to make sure they're orthonormal, let's evaluate the length squared of each one, which is the sum of the squares of these entries. And of course, this is 9 25th plus 16 25th, that's 1. Here we'll have 4 squared plus 5 squared plus 3 squared divided by 50. You can make sure that's 1. And the same three numbers here, 16 plus 25 plus 9 divided by 50 squared by 50. That's 1 as well. So I specifically made sure that the columns of this matrix are orthonormal. That means that this matrix is orthogonal, that it times its, that its transpose, which will turn these row columns into rows, times the matrix itself, is the identity matrix, once again, which is totally equivalent to the fact that this matrix, excuse me, that the columns are orthonormal. But we just discovered that orth or, excuse me, orthonormal columns imply orthonormal rows. And that's just hard to believe that it would be true. But let's make sure of that. Let's first make sure that they're orthogonal. And I do think it's magical. It's just phenomenal how it works out. So here we go. We have zero here, 20 50th minus 20 50th, zero. And here we have 
uh, let's see, 12 25th. Well, we have to be a little careful. So we have 12 25th minus 12 50th minus 12 50th plus 12 50th. Excuse me, minus 12 50th, minus 12 50th, and of course it's zero. And I'm making sure the last two will have minus 15 50th plus 15 50th, and that's of course zero. So they're orthogonal, but are they actually orthonormal? Well, we'll just make sure that one of them is, and you'll make sure that the other two are. Let's look at the first row. We're adding up the squares of the elements. We have 9 25th plus 16 50th plus 16 50th. Is this one? I don't know. So here we have 18 plus 16 plus 16 50th. 50 over 50 equals 1. It's really amazing. And well, how about this one? Well, here it's easy. 25 50th plus 25 5 50th. And I'm just going to take this joy away from you and do the last row myself. We'll have 16 25th, 16 25th plus 9 50th plus 9 50th. What do we have here? 32 50th, 32 plus 18. 50 50th equals 1. So here is the magic. If columns are orthonormals, orthonormal, then the rows are orthonormal as well. And you might suspect for a moment that if the columns are merely orthogonal, then the rows would be orthogonal. Let's see if that's true. It's very easy to come up, to take this matrix and come up with a much simpler matrix that's simply orthogonal without being orthonormal. Just lose the denominators and we have 3, 0, 4, 4, 5, negative 3, and negative 4, 5, 3. Now this matrix is orthogonal, you can make sure of it just like we did here, without being orthonormal. Its columns are orthogonal. So this product would be a diagonal matrix. Ha! Huh, easy fix. Without being, <laughs> without being orthonormal. And now we just lost our argument that reversing this would be the same matrix. It works when the right hand side is the identity matrix. It does not work if it's merely diagonal. So you will find out that this matrix is actually not orthogonal. It's not anything. And because of the sneaky zero, you will see that the first two columns actually, uh, excuse me, the first, two row, the first two rows and the last two rows actually are orthogonal. That's an accident. But if you compare first and third, we have 12 minus 12 minus 12. Of course, that's not zero. So uh, because of the zero, we can, sort of be, we can sort of be tricked into thinking there is something there. In the general case, there is nothing there whatsoever. This was just a coincidence. So if columns are orthogonal, rows are nothing special. But if the columns are orthonormal, then rows are orthonormal as well. That came from what I used to have on the board before. So this completes our discussion and now we really understand the dot product perspective on matrix multiplication and all of its important implications.